Okay, if you want to have your seats, I think we're ready to go. Okay, good morning. I'm Deputy Mayor Jennifer McAlvey. I'm the Vice Chair of the Executive Committee. The clerk has confirmed that we have quorum and I will call the fifth meeting of the Executive, Executive Committee to order. Welcome everyone to the Scarborough Civic Center. Today's meeting is being held with members of council and city staff participating by both video conference and here in person. The Scarborough Civic Center is open to the public and anyone is welcome to attend the meeting at the Scarborough Civic Center today. The public may continue to participate electronically by video conference. This meeting is also being live streamed online at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council Live. The clerk staff have connected remote public speakers to the meeting by video conference, and there are public speakers in the room with us today. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the executive committee's page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. The city clerk has provided all agenda materials via the clerk's meeting portal. Clerk's IT staff will be available to participants to help with your devices. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I'll then create a speakers list and will call on members when it is their turn. When voting on an item or a motion, I ask members to ensure they turn on their video and raise their hand to indicate their vote. Members, this is a paperless meeting, and I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at exe at toronto.ca to help with motions. Although we are meeting in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you have an interest, please raise your hand and unmute your mic. Seeing none, um, we have a motion to confirm the minutes of the meeting on May 2nd. Councillor Ainsley, all those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. Okay, before we go into the agenda, I have a few announcements to make. The first is that Councillor Bradford is not joining us today because yesterday he welcomed Bronwyn to his family. So a pretty good reason not to come to committee is uh, welcoming his new baby girl to the family. Yeah, that's right. The only reason we'll let is legitimate for skipping out. Uh, so we wish his, our best wishes to, to him and Catherine and, uh, the, her, baby, and her big sister um, and congratulate them on welcoming Bronwyn again. Other things that we did want to point out is that the reason we are meeting in Scarborough Civic Centre is not just because I'm from Scarborough, which we know is a main part of it, uh, also because it is the 50th anniversary of both the Scarborough Civic Centre and the Scarborough Town Centre. So let's give it up for them. So there is coffee outside and a cake that said happy, happy 50th, it's been cut up, happy 50th uh, Scarborough Center and uh, the second one says STC which is uh, Scarborough Town Center and STC which is the Scarborough Civic Center. Following the meeting, uh, everyone is invited to walk over to the Scarborough Town Center with us. Uh, we will be taking a photo at the balloons and the background, right? Some people know what the balloons are. Uh, so for many, many years, there were hot air balloons uh, under a fountain there and they were an icon of Scarborough and uh, all the kids in Scarborough love the balloons. But of course, burning fossil fuels now is bad as is having a hot metal that you can fall into and burn your hand. So they took, the, they unfortunately, because of present day safety, uh, safety standards, thanks planning, um, the balloons were decommissioned, but they are back for a limited time with a new and improved safety improvement. So please do join us to walk over there and uh, check out that important Scarborough icon, uh, iconic, uh, I iconic, uh, I guess, Sculpture? Fountain? I don't know. I don't know what you call it. Anyway. Okay, so now we'll move on to our business of the day. Item EX 5.1, Next Generation 911 Agreements. Would anybody like to hold the item? I'd like to hold it. Okay. Or Councillor uh, Chang. I, Councillor Chang's hand was up first. Okay, Councillor Chang is handing it, and I also have a technical amendment, so we'll just ask to advance circulate that as well. Okay. 
Um, and with apologies, um, Councillor Ainsley, uh, we'll go back, we'll introduce your new item first, EX 5.9. Did you want to introduce the item so we can add it to the agenda? I'm introducing item EX 5.9, which is a summary of my, sorry, is it on, does it need to go on the screen or? This is a report, so I've been appointed by a city council to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, so this is just my regular update on what's happening at the Federation. Um, and there you are. I'd like to introduce it. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of introducing this item. Okay, and we can uh, call on that when we get to it in the list. Okay, the next item is EX 5.2 Smart Track Stations Program Provincial Funding Update. Would anybody like to hold this item? So okay. Me. Uh, Councillor Ainsley is moving this item. I will note that staff are still continuing to work on a supporting report that will come directly to Council. Uh, so all those in favor of receiving this for information, all those opposed, that oh, item carries. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I got distracted and I can't get my agenda on my screen. So could you, what, what did we just ask for? Smart track. Oh, okay. To come to Council. EX 5.3 update on Metrolink subways program. Uh, I will hold this item as we have a deputant. EX 5.4, City of Toronto Investment Report for the year of 2022. Anybody like to hold this item? Sorry, I'm, ha I'm, sorry, I'm having technological difficulties. Could you just say that? Yeah, I can see them slower. Why, why don't I just cut to the chase? I want to hold three to you. Okay, so next one. Okay, uh, so this was EX 5.4, City of Toronto Investment Report. Uh, Councillor Crawford, would you like to move it? All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. EX 5.5, create TO. Councillor Carroll is holding. EX 5.6, Amendment to Toronto Fire Services 2023 Approved Capital Budget for the Next Generation 911 Capital Project in Amendment to Blanket Contract 47023903. Um, would anybody like to hold this item? Okay. We held item one. Oh, only if it gets held. Did anybody want to hold this item? Okay. Uh, somebody like to move the item? Kelsey Crawford's moving. All those in favor? All those opposed, that carries. EX 5.7, Open Data Centralized Platform and Compliance Standards. Would anybody like to hold this item? Yeah. Councilor Needsley's moving. All those in favor? Sorry. Any amendment? Okay, Councilor Needsley has an amendment. Oh, a technical amendment. Technical. Up on screen. Yes, it, it's a little bit long because it's technical <laughs> on open data. This is from staff. Can we go back up? I just want to finish reading the part that we're back. No, uh, or so, sorry, go back down. I, I, I want to read not the deleted part, that part, yeah. Okay, all those in favor, all those opposed on the amendment, on the item is amended, all those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. That brings us to EX 5.8, diversifying civic appointees on the Toronto Transit Board Commission. Would anybody like to hold this item? I do have a motion we can pull up. So this is recognizing that there's a broader city process coming on and that it's important that we look at this same issue for all of our boards and committees. And so it's referring it to the city clerk for consideration. We're preparing the report on the review of public appointments policy, which is anticipated in the fall of 2023. Okay, I have a yeah. Do you want to hold it? Oh, or just on the amendment or? Yeah, we can just keep moving. Okay, we'll hold. And you can advance circulate the motion as well. EX 5.9, Federation of Canadian Municipalities Annual Conference and Trade Show, May 25th to May 28th. Uh, Councillor Ainsley submitted his report. Um, would anybody like to hold this item? Somebody like to move the item? Uh, can, well, Councillor Ainsley can move his item. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Okay, so we are back to the top of the agenda, EX 5.1, Next Generation 911 Agreements. Councillor Chang, you had questions? Deb, thank you. Um, so it's great. 
we're going into a next generation of technology. I recently went to the Smart City Summit uh, in Taipei, Taiwan, and I noticed that they had a 911 video call uh, ability through a, a city app. And I noticed in this report that eventually multimedia messages could be a part of 911 calls. So I'm just wondering, does this technology already have that capacity? Or will we have to pay extra money to, in order for that to work? Good morning. Good morning. Through the chair, um, the answer is there will be no additional cost for that. There will be a, a bit of an extended time frame before we get to that point. Once Ex the technology is implemented, allow it to mature and we'll figure out how to operationalize this content and then we'll probably be looking at uh, in partnership with our friends at Toronto Police and Toronto Paramedics bringing that functionality. That, that would be great sense. especially we have people in our city whose English is not uh, their first language so being able to have video calls I think would um, ensure that they can communicate what is happening without using words. Is there a, a, how long it would take? Is it a few years? Um, I would think you're going to measure this in years. years. Out. Okay. There, this is a national initiative. This just isn't Toronto. Right. So really looking, the CRTC is looking at industry to inform policy on how right. we operationalize some of this, this um, multimedia content. So it, it will take a number of years. I can't tell you whether there. that's three or five, but probably in that ballpark. Okay. Uh, another question I have is, as you know, you know, we've been trying to expand our ability to respond to mental health crises with uh, something called the Community Crisis Response, as well as the police have the Mobile Crisis Intervention Team. Would they be considered as public safety answer points in this package, or would we have to pay extra to expand capacity to include them? through the chair, uh, they would not be considered a public safety answering point at this point in time. So if we were to designate them as such, there would be some additional fees to connect them to the ESINET, um, to the next-gen 911 uh, network, and probably some governance at the, at the federal level to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I am concerned we're locking ourselves into a 10-year contract. Is that mandated by the CRTC? Because technology is changing so quickly, uh, and and then as we expand certain things like the community crisis intervention, uh, we're going to be in a position where we can't really negotiate good fees in advance uh, because we're locked into a 10-year contract. Is that something that we can pre-negotiate in terms of uh, what expanding our PSAPs uh, might look like? Is there a fee structure for that in advance of signing the contract? Through the chair, yes, there is uh, tariffs that dictate what those charges are. Um, they're not insurmountable by any means. It's essentially establishing a connection at a different location. Um, in terms of, of what the agreement specifies is really how that connection works. Um, what we carry in that connection will be subject to further uh, discussions and standards through through the CRTC and, and uh, the Emergency Service Working Group, which... So is it the federal government that is requiring us to sign into a 10-year contract? Um, indirectly, yes, because they, they essentially have vetted the contract that Bell has provided us. And from a carrier's perspective, you can't imagine Bell Canada going around to every municipality and negotiating a separate mm -hmm. deal. This contract was vetted through the CRTC. It seems to address um, most, if not all, the components required for connection to the next-gen 911 network. And I don't think um, the technology is going to evolve beyond that in the next 10 years. I think it sets up the foundation for what we need to do. Great. And my final question is, um, if we want to uh, expand to include community crisis response. Is that something that is already planned or is that something we would have to initiate? I believe that's something we would have to initiate. There would have to be some discussions in terms of what, um, to use the jargon that CRTC uses and the carriers use. I don't think they currently meet the definition of a trusted entity. So we would have to expand upon that 
to look at the services they provide as being adjunct or part of uh, emergency services. And Councillor, right. uh, through the chair, Paul Raft is behind you here. Oh. Just to support what Frank is saying, we will ensure that we're working with the emergency services and the community crisis service as we move forward to make sure that the appropriate functionality takes place and there's seamless integration there for sure. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Additional questions on this item? Councillor Carroll, followed by Councillor Ainsley. Yeah, just to follow up, because um, I, I don't have time now to go back and look for the wording, but 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 in the early days of looking at next gen and that, that it was going to be much more integrated, um, how we negotiated the contract, there was talk of, because we, because we are entering to something that's membership, the part of the service agreements is going to be that if there are technological updates, we all get to take part in them. Is that, is that not part of the contract? Uh, through the chair, no, not really. The contract establishes the technical means for that connection. Yeah. So if you can imagine, um, it dictates how and who is allowed to connect. Right. What we carry on that really is subject to operational discussions um, with, with the public safety community in general and the, and the carrier. So there's a mechanism through the CRTC and the Emergency Services Working Group where we can influence how the CRTC regulates Next Gen 911. So this makes us part of next gen. This just gets us, we're part of the big move now that, that we've been talking about. This has been a line at the bottom of the page in the budget for years, getting next gen. So we're making the big move from analog to internet. But what we're adopting today doesn't include the service agreement that, that, that outlines how uh, technological patch updates would happen. That, so there, so the updates would, would all come at additional costs later? They could, or they could not. Depends on the nature of the update and the changes <laughs> that are being introduced. We may need to, to uh, invest in our infrastructure to be able to support some of the changes coming forward. But it's too soon to tell whether that's going to be the case. So we're really <laughs> still in the... So we're really still in the forming stage here. This is not the day, this is it, this is ne ne Abs next Absolutely. Year. What we're doing today is really um, taking the same content through a different mechanism, through a different pipe. Right, right, yeah. It's just, it's just that's what we were told years ago, and I thought today is the day, done. But, but this is just the first step. This first is the step. first step in the evolution. Okay, those are my questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Uh, thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, so the two things that stood out to me in this report was analog services and future capabilities. And those two kind of stood out because recently I've had an ongoing contacts from my residents saying when they tried to call 911, um, they're either put on hold or is busy. I actually had a resident yesterday that said they, when they called 911, um, they were put on hold. The first two calls it was busy, then they were put on hold for almost 11 minutes. So what we're doing today when you talk about moving away from analog and enhanced future, enhanced future capabilities, is that gonna reduce that from occurring? I can go back to my residents and say, you know, we had this whole debate at executive committee we're working at changing that, or is that something completely different? Um, and to the chair again, I don't want to speak for my friends at Toronto Police, who are, are the city's primary PSAP. Um, we will be getting, or they will be getting, uh, more accurate information. I could only assume that that would, that would mean that, that things progress faster than they are now, but there's a lot of components to that in terms of uh, the 911 call answer piece. So I. I would defer to them. Okay. I if, think they're here. Did you want to answer? Yeah. Good morning. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, Superintendent Vanderheiden, I'm the uh, commander in charge of our communications uh, PSAP at Toronto Police. Uh, I can't answer that question through the chair. The, uh, the answer is it's the people at the end of the line, the actual me mechanism that it gets to those people. 
um, isn't the big issue. The, the issue is staffing. Um, what will happen in the uh, next gen environment is the queue will be longer. Right now we're, we're limited by the number of copper lines that physically enter our comm center. Uh, theoretically, MG will eliminate that cap. What doesn't eliminate it is how many people are at the other end with headsets on answering. So that queue will be longer. The busy signals won't happen, but they, uh, there actually will be a longer lineup um, capable before someone gets an actual busy signal. To get put into a queue, it won't be a busy signal. Okay, so with the doing away from the analog, so if I'm a 911 operator at the other end, does that give me the ability to, like, so if you're calling, both of you are calling at the same time, they can they only answer one call at a time and say, so the first call they deal with, the second call they'll quickly say, you know, hold please, does the, pros, does the response time get quicker and they can handle more at the same time or the speed through the system is just quicker? Uh, through you, Chair, uh, no, they, uh, they won't be able to answer and say, please hold. That'll happen automatically. They'll get put into a queue where they'll receive an automated message. And uh, once they uh, are connected to a human being at the other end of the line, then they'll deal with that call uh, and then continue through that call until it's finished. But again, it's, uh, it's a number of people sitting at the other end uh, at our comm center with headsets on. That's, that's the uh, choke point. And through the, through the chair uh, to the councillor, just to build on that, this particular report is related to the contract only, not the operational performance. So it's the signing of the contract to allow the move from analog um, to the new technology that, that is identified in this report. The operational performance pieces will come later as new technology comes online. Okay. Because I just, so as a city council with my residents that are starting to complain a lot about 911 and being put on hold for, you know, 11 minutes, um, you know, if I'm voting on this today, I want some assurance that we're moving forward and I'm not going to go back to my res. My residents aren't going to call me and say, you know, I had a conversation with you on Monday, you, about 911, you just approved, I forget how many millions of dollars this is, and you know, how did that improve my service? Yes, understood. And this report isn't about the service. It's just about the contract between the city and Bell to move the new technology forward. Yep. But it's still that amount of money that we're going to spend. Yeah, understood. So I can explain that to my resident, but they'll still say, you know, how did that increase or enhance the fact? How's it stopping the next time I call 911 from being put on hold for 11 minutes, right? So, okay, thank you. Those are my questions, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, additional questions? Councilor Prosper. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, through you to staff, I guess when I look at this, uh, when I see CRTC and I see we're negotiating with, with one company, there really isn't a lot to negotiate here. Bell Canada and the CRTC must have some kind of an idea of the regulated costs of this and that our wiggle room is very small. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, through the chair, that is correct. This is, this is mandated that we move forward with this and there's, there's really no room for negotiation. So the recommendations before us is, is really to delegate authority and we're delegating it to our very capable city manager. Now in, in both the motions before us, it doesn't say that it really reports back to city council once the memorandum of agreement or understanding is, is signed. Uh, but in the report, it does say any future needs or under, and or financial implications for future instances identified in the agreement where the city or the PS, PSAPs will incur such fees that will come back to, to council. So. Will, will the, I guess, will the memorandum of understanding once negotiated come back to, to council for a finer, final look-see or will that, uh, that be a done deal? And how is that related to uh, the other reference in the report where council will be consulted if there are future funding needs or financial implications? Through the chair. Um. There are no financial obligations with this report whatsoever. What it says is if there are any future ones, we'll be taking them through the regular budget submission process. And really the only cost that could be incurred would be if we were to, to stand up a new PSAP as an example, where we would require uh, to bring that connection to a different physical location. 
So it 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 comes back if there's financial implications of a a serious nature. It would come back through the same process of, of any other piece through the budget process, Councillor. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Additional questions of staff? Great. Seeing none, speakers on this item. Councillor Ainsley? Okay. Seeing no speakers, Councillor Ainsley would like to move the item. Sure. All those in favor? All those opposed? This item carries. And just given the level of interest in questions, um, you may want to offer... A briefing to councillors that are interested before council as well. Um, okay, uh, EX 5.3, update on Metrolink subway pr uh, program, second quarter. We have one deputant, uh, Rick Siccarelli. Rick, thank you for joining us, and you can take a spot at the podium right beside you there. And you have five minutes. Apology. We're going to reopen that item quickly. All those in favor of reopening? All those opposed? That carries. I had a, a technical item to add the word board after Toronto Police Services. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Toronto Police Services Board. All those in favor of the amendment? All opposed? The amendment carries. All those in favor of the item is amended? All those opposed? That item carries. No, point, point of order, it was, it was, it was my fault. I was uh, distracting her on another minute. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we're back on EX 5.3. Our speaker is Rick uh, Siccarelli with the Mount Dennis Eco Neighborhood Initiative. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and Executive Committee members, Councillor Nunziata, Mr. Toigo, and staff, I'm Rick Cicerelli. I'm a volunteer with the Mount Dennis Eco Neighborhood Initiative. And um, we're a local grassroots partnership affiliated with Mount Dennis Community Association. Um, we're, our aim is climate action in the neighborhood. Today's deputation concerns the Mount Dennis Scarlet segment of the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension. Um, as contained in the information provided to you by uh, Mr. Toigo's report on uh, transit expansion update. We've got um, three initial um, areas of focus um, plus next steps. Community engagement. Um, when the initial process to review alternatives was first set up by Metrolinx, MDCA was told that the working committee was for the Etobicoke segment and that Metrolinx would come back to the Mont Dennis segment with alternatives to discuss specific to crossing uh, the river and connecting into Mont Dennis Station. Since that time, this has been ignored. Uh, we've attempted at the point where uh, online consultations took place uh, following the, the decision um, to, for Metrolinx to proceed with a specific design, um, that the initial business case was final, um, that the community's input wasn't required for the design elements crossing between Etobicoke portal from the existing um, Tunnel 1 project and the proposed Tunnel 2 project from that, that connects into Metro, Mount Dennis Station. We've attempted to um, recognize our history with Metrolinx um, as being um, the world-class bridge, which was promised on the Eglinton Crosstown, not materializing as being the damage to the forest on the Black Creek side that has not been rectified. Um, and that we had a process of escalating those understandings um, and the, the um, proposed 
collaborative process um, that went to City Council last summer as well as to Metrolink's board. Um, this has not been successful. We've attempted to um, work with the community um, working group that was set up um, and raise our issues, but we're told that it's basically an implementation working group. It's not a design working group. And it didn't have interest in taking a look at the environmental impacts, only the repair of the damage. So um, we're asking the city uh, to act on behalf of the local community and reassess what the um, problems are that the environmental, um, sorry, that the Eglinton West Crosstown Extension's selected bridge infrastructure will cause. Um, we believe that this is a community engagement failure. Local Indigenous relations is their second point. Um, I won't go into um, this in any great extent because as a coalition member, I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of the Indigenous community. Um, the river known as the Humber has particular significance, as people well know. Um, and um, the Carrying Place heritage uh, has fundamental connection to the crown history of settlement in this area. So it's fundamentally important that we get it right. Um, and right now, Metrolinx has not been getting it right. I think we can't overstate the need for that. Um, work that's happening along the riverside for years um, has been ignored by Metrolinx. Despite our efforts, we've made intentional efforts to bridge representatives that have been working on cultural plantings, cultural knowledge exchange um, through that area um, and been rebuffed. So once the coalition um, was established and the, the dispute was recognized, um, we are asking that the city continue to take interest in building the indigenous relations part that is missing in this project. Thank you. Um, the American Indian Movement is now the lead of the local coalition. Metrolinx senior VP responsible for indigenous relations is to be contacting them uh, within the coming week. We're hoping that the city has interest maintained in this and that this is not just oh, well, the, the, the rights that were part of the land that the TPs now sit on are now Metrolinx's responsibility. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, Third is the reassessment. You're at six and a half minutes. I can give you like 30 more seconds. I'll, I'll try and wrap this quickly. Um, Metrolinx is, has been asked for a separate community working group on impacts. The coalition has asked Metrolinx that these be uh, an assessment of alternatives from um, indigenous perspective impacts and um, Mount Danesico neighborhood is asking that these include the at grade connection between portals. Great. Thank you so much for coming in today. Are there questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Thank you for coming. Uh, questions of staff. Councillor Chang. Councillor Malik, I have some questions. Okay. Sorry, yes, we have outside councillors joining us. Okay, Councillor Malik, followed by Councillor Chang. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the report. Uh, my first question is about um, the piece in the uh, report about city divisions, and particularly as it relates to the Ontario line. <clears throat> the report outlines 14 different city departments that are working on the Ontario Line project with Metrolinx. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more how this works in, uh, and how this work is coordinated within the city. 
So through you, uh, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, Councillor, the various divisions each have their own um, kind of work package related to uh, whatever services they would provide. They would be coordinating it uh, through transit expansion. Transit expansion would uh, then be uh, obviously coordinating with Metrolinx on the responses and vice versa. So what happens as Metrolinx submits through uh, either reviews or documentation, it would come to transit expansion and then we would share it with the various divisions uh, to make sure that they're getting the, hopefully the correct information that they need to do a more efficient review. Okay, so uh, just to be clear, transit expansion is doing the coordination across divisions? That's correct. Okay, and so Metro, is Metrolinx hearing from each city division individually, or is it only coming through um, transit expansion? So through the, through the chair, again to you, Councillor, the um, various divisions, once, once the initial um, input has re been received by uh, transit expansion, and we shared it with a particular division, say for example, uh, transportation services, who um, are, have to work very closely with Metrolinx uh, as it relates to the downtown core, then there would be actual direct consultation between, uh, say for example, transportation services and Metrolinx. But again, tra transit expansion would be involved in those discussions as well. Thank you very much. Um, my next uh, uh, set of questions is just on University Park. Um, during um, the issue around the tree removal at Osgoode Hall, a number of community stakeholders were pushing for the station to be moved uh, to University Park. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what commitments uh, Metrolinx would need from the city to make this proposal potentially go forward. So through, you, through the chair to yourself, Councillor, um, to be clear, Metrolinx has, uh, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, indicated that the entrance that they've proposed uh, at the uh, northwest corner of University and Queen is their preferred location. In order for them to change, they would need a specific direction from City Council, uh, together with a commitment on the full funding of any sort of work, uh, design work, the work associated with potential construction, as well as any sort of potential delay um, that would be um, um, that would occur as a result of that direction. And it would still be, again, up to the province to make the determination um, uh, uh, through the uh, Upload Act to actually make the determination as to whether or not they would want to proceed with that work. Okay, and I'm not sure if anyone from Parks is there, if this is information that you might have, but what is the potential timeline for work going forward regarding University Park, particularly south of college? And um, if you do have a sense of those timelines, uh, saying a little bit about how those line up with Metrolinx's work, um, scheduled work around Osgood Station. So through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, hello, Councilor Malik. Uh, the, the work for University Park, uh, you know, the first work that would have to happen would be an environmental assessment, which would take, uh, I'm hearing, at least a few years. But also to know that University Park is not yet funded within the city's 10-year capital plan. The only work that we have at this point that's been authorized and uh, funded is some of the preliminary sort of feasibility studying that we're doing, but that's the extent of, of the actual work that is funded within the budget. And so just the second part of the question, thank you for that. How, did it, how does that timeline um, match up with what Metrolinx has scheduled, um, particularly on Oxford Station? So through the chair to you, Councillor, it does not line up at all. In fact, the uh, contract for the uh, tunnel works has already, uh, has already been awarded. Uh, work uh, on the tunneling will commence um, this year. So in, in short time, in, in a few months, um, and uh, any sort of changes now would cause a significant delay to that, to the tunnel contract. Okay, okay thank you. And um, 
but, uh, just this going back for a moment last, to I just University want to say this will be your Park. last one. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, what um, I, this report was also a keen reminder about the importance of University Park and moving it forward. So just wanted to hear a little bit more about what needs to be done at the council level to move um, this project forward. Can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, so through the chair, University Park is one of the projects what, that was uh, listed in a priority downtown park report that went forward. And that report also does, uh, you know, this is before the discussion around University Park uh, specific to the new Ontario line occurred, but it, it does look at timelines that are uh, at least medium to long term and not short term. So if it's council's desire to move that project forward faster, we would certainly need uh, to do uh, a whole lot more feasibility planning and also have a source of funding uh, to move it forward. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Chang, five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Through the chair, um, <clears throat> I just have a few questions about Cummer Station, which is supposed to happen in my neighborhood and has disappeared off everyone's budgets. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, although it says, you know, very not enough revenue would be generated from a transit-oriented community, I'm wondering if there has been any examination of how much could be, uh, how much capital we could raise by by doing that, just because. Uh, I always believe that if we're asking for money, we should try to pitch in where we can, even if it is minimal, but just exploring how much revenue could we uh, generate through a TOC. Is that a, that's a question probably for... For us. Yeah, thanks. Yes, through the chair. So, uh, Councillor, we did do uh, an assessment of what remains around there mm -hmm. uh, that might be developable as, as some sort of transit-oriented development partnership. There's a lot of development that has already happened in the Cummer area in anticipation of a station there, and so the horse is out of the barn. There are a couple of properties, but they're relatively small, and so we don't see a huge potential to extract much, mm -hmm. you know, a few million, but not a lot in terms of a contribution to the, the, the pretty large cost of, right. a, of a station there. Yeah, I just would like us to show our best effort, even if it's one or two million, um, to say, hey, we're going to do this. Now meet us in the middle of the dance floor, please. Uh, okay, the other question I have is, is there um, a possibility of working uh, with the developers uh, who have been approved uh, for a lot of density because of this the station to work together to amplify the need for a station at this location? So through the, uh, through the chair, uh, certainly, I mean, I'll answer that in two ways. Okay, certainly sure. getting some of those developers to, to advocate for including a station, um, I'm, I'm sure would be helpful. Mm -hmm. they've, they've built with, uh, many of them built with the anticipation there will be a station there. I'm not sure if you're getting at whether we could approach those developers about now chipping in to the cost of a station, which may be one of the questions that comes to them even from the province. Mm -hmm. And that would involve opening up approvals and maybe some existing Section 37 deals. I'd, like it, be, it could become a, a pretty complex exercise if we start going down that path of, of opening up existing development approvals. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. And has it ever been um, examined what kind of transit plan would have to be in place uh, in replacement of Cummer Station? So if there is no Cummer Station, we have thousands of people within a radius of that intersection. Um, is there a plan of how we will encourage so many people to get to a subway station as their main transportation? Through the chair to Councillor Cheng, uh, the Metrolinx uh, IBC, the initial business case for the Young North subway extension, did examine uh, all of those things. And they came out with uh, the walk shed area of both Steel Station and Finch Station overlap at, uh, at, at uh, Cummer and Drury Avenue. So their argument was, well, people could walk to either of those other stations. 
which is technically true. Um, there is, nevertheless, there's quite a bit of development that has happened and continues to happen. Uh, a lot of it's authorized through the Ontario Land Tribunal. Um, again, premised on this idea of uh, a commerce station being there, but now also premised on other development that's already come and is under construction in the area. Uh, so again, uh, the horse has left the barn, as James said. Uh, <clears throat> but the, the transit that's in place there uh, consists of bus service now and will continue to consist of bus service if it isn't a subway station. And, uh, and again, the, the walk shed is such that within about a 10 minute walk, you could get to one of the other stations. I think there's a radius that's larger um, around the density that it would be 15 minutes for a group of the condos that are coming, but 10 from the exact location. And I'm just wondering, why do you think our strong business case has been turned down by the provincial government? Uh, through the chair, the, we, we put our best foot forward when the IBC came to the city for its review and comment. Uh, we did, we did uh, note that we felt Metrolinx had understated the, uh, the amount of development that would be coming at uh, Cummer and Dury. So they were put on notice uh, uh, that, that we felt that way. Um, there is a limited budget to do this project, and so they had decided that they would proceed with Clark Station for whatever reasons uh, that they have. Um, they did come back later to offer to, to do Cummer Station, and the offer was that uh, any TOC, transit-oriented community, revenues that, the, that could be generated in the area could go to the City of Toronto to help offset the cost. Uh, of course, we've done a, an, an initial assessment of what that might look like, and it's not looking very promising. Okay, thank you. Okay, additional questions? Okay, seeing none, speakers on this item. Councillor Malik, did you want to speak? Yes, I did. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, appreciate um, the opportunity to speak at the committee, um, particularly on the section of the report dealing with the Ontario line. As you might know, it was derived from the report request made at the first subcommittee meeting on Ontario lines construction at Toronto and East York Community Council. And at the subcommittee, we heard from residents across the city that they had concerns regarding the upcoming construction of the line. And they had concerns in so many different ways from the impact on neighborhoods, to local businesses, um, to how it was being um, managed in relation to parks projects and uh, the work across divisions. I wanna thank our community stakeholders and organizers, including the Bold Coalition, who've been working tirelessly to ensure residents' voices are heard when they have felt left out of Metrolinx's processes. Construction of the Ontario line must be responsible and transparent with real community collaboration uh, that message was clear and we know that public transit is vital to keep our city moving and growing and while we don't want to slow this process down we must work together to ensure this project is built right and with community and residents not just in mind but as part of the process i want to express my immense gratitude to the transit expansion office for bring, bringing this report together so quickly and we will be tracking to have a final meeting of the subcommittee in july which will include a final report outlining a clear set of recommendations to Metrolinx and the provincial government on our expectations of how the building and implementation of the Ontario line can ensure the best results are achieved for Toronto residents in terms of design, construction, and community benefit. I look forward to seeing that report and to be able to get that leadership from City Council and showing Metrolinx how we can all work together to achieve the best results when it comes to building transit in Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, additional speakers, Council Chang. Hi, uh, I have a, through the chair, I have a motion or a few motions to move. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, young, the trans transit expansion team for their input into these motions as well as uh, transit planning from planning. So these are the four points of my motion. One is to explore federal funding uh, opportunities to contribute towards Commerce Station. We know the federal government is announcing new funding for infrastructure. 
The second one is uh, that we explore how much money we can generate through transit-oriented communities. I know that you know, we've taken a look and we've seen it is limited, but I always believe in, in, in saying, here's what we can pitch in. And even if it is minimal, it shows that we have genuine interest and we're making our best effort. So just examining how much revenue could be generated by creating a transit-oriented community development. Uh, the third one is that we come up with a report on the transit that will be needed to serve the projected growth. So how many more buses would we need uh, for people to get to the subway station if we don't have Commerce Station? And the fourth motion is that beside every new development, just right now in Willowdale, if you buy a new condo, there's a big sign that says, your kids will not go to school here. Uh, the <laughs> and basically, um, the Ontario Land Tribunal has approved all this density at this intersection on the basis that there would be a subway station. So we want people to know, future buyers as well as developers, that there will be no subway station. So it's just to explore the cost of creating and posting signage uh, in the Young Street and Cummer Avenue area beside every new development notice to announce that there is no plan or funding in place to build Cummer Station as part of the Young North subway extension and report back to council on the funding required to produce and install that signage. Those are my four motions, and uh, I just want to say that the people that I'm speaking for today are, are not in my neighborhood yet, because this is for all the approved and planned developments at Young and Comer, uh, and there's tremendous density that has been planned for that intersection, approved at the OLT. And we are trying to foster uh, alternative transportation that's not driving. Uh, we're, we have a beautiful subway extension happening. And I think that it is important that the future residents of Willowdale have easy access to the subway in order to encourage more of them to take the subway. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, the mover? Uh, just a quick question. I've read sure. them all quickly. I'm just confirming all four include a report back, so there's yes. no authorization of any funds here. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Carroll, five minutes. I, yeah, I just wanted to speak to this because it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a lesson for the future, uh, or or it's just plain a, a beware when you do plan. Um, what's and I say this, I, I'm painfully aware of the fact that 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 in the ward that I now represent, I'm the beneficiary of the most political subway station of them all <laughs> at Bessarian. But it's, it's, fr it's extremely frustrating when we do plan and, and, then, uh, and then transit uh, uh, decides to go elsewhere. Because I, while I have, at one end of my ward, I have a very political station and it's only now starting to achieve its ridership 20, 25 years late. Um, because it, it was really maybe not needed at all. The, the distance between uh, uh, Old Leslie Station and Bayview Station is comically short, and yet there's another station in between. Um, but uh, uh, at the other end uh, of my ward is a long stretch of intense density, 43 stories uh, uh, heading towards Scarborough in a place where there was one day going to be an LRT station, and now, of course, there is not. Um, and, and the subway is at the very bottom of the list of the, the, uh, the mobility plan of the, the province, not, not even on the radar of Metrolinx, because they have so much to do in the, in the forefront of their plan. And so I'm, I'm frustrated by when, when we go forward and we, we make minutes of settlement agreements about developments based on, on stations. Uh, I would, I would really be interested, I hope as part of this report, and, I, and, I, and I'm not going to amend the motion, but I think we need to go back and look at the OLT decisions uh, of each of the projects that's there now in the Newtonbrook area, Cummer area. Um, were they based on there being a station here, or were, there, were they based on the subway expanding to Richmond Hill? Did they you know, indemnify themselves by wording their decisions very carefully, or do they actually... Uh, do they actually anticipate an actual station? If that's written into the decision, we have a real case here that you made a commitment. 
and and so perhaps this is one of those political stations you're going to have to you're going to have to put in because uh, you kind of made a political decision in 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 going ahead with the developments that are already under construction. I think some of them, the buildings are almost occupied now. Uh, if that's the case, then I think we really start to 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 have have uh, a new pathway that we need to really look at. Um, we need to hold them to things that they wrote into their own Ontario Land Tribunal and before that LPAT and OMB decisions. If they actually quoted because there's going to be a commerce station, then everybody needs to wake up to the fact that they have to help us out here. If not, if they were general about it, then, then it really does become math. It's about what are the distances between stations, uh, what are the alternate routes. Do you build a subway station so people can walk to it, or do you build it because it has, it has easy logistics to build to, uh, designs for bus routes to get to it? And how close are the other bus routes? I'm sure that entered into their decision. Lots of buses will go to Steeles. Lots of buses will go to Finch. So let's just skip Cummer. We really want to expand into Richmond Hill. But if you made a commitment in your own supposedly apolitical tribunal, you really need to honor that commitment. And so I think, uh, I think we need to see if there's, uh, there's evidence in those documents. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, additional speakers to this item? Okay. Uh, seeing none, a motion to move the item. Councillor Ainsley, all those in favor? All, oh, sorry, Councillor uh, Councilor Chang's motion first. Okay, we'll vote on Councillor Chang's motion first. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. On the item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed? That carries. Uh, EX 5.5, create TO financial results. Councilor Carroll, you had questions of staff? I do. Uh, thank you. I don't know if we have... Uh... Oh, VIX online. I thought. Good morning, Mr. Gupta. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to understand this. Um, uh, in the report, and then it's, it's mentioned uh, uh, again uh, uh, lightly in the... Uh, in the the uh, uh, the audited statements, but it's it's right there in the draft. So maybe you can help me with this. I'm trying to understand the relationship between the management fees and the city funding, um, because it 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 sounds like it sounds like uh, uh, it, it, we're saying that the management fees fluctuate because the city funding fluctuated. The the sentence structure is kind of confusing me. And then again, it's it's mentioned in a confusing way in the audit. Isn't it the case that you know if the if the management fees come in under funded underfunded then 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 we add city funding to 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 make you whole? What's the relationship between uh, those two? Yeah, not not really. My uh, our CFO Jaspreet Hunter Kosingham is in is there with you in the room, oh. and I'm going to ask her to answer that specifically, and then and then Councillor Carroll, I, I'll make some more general comments about how we record that city funding and what that really is all about. But, but Jess, okay. maybe, maybe you can answer the culture specific question. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, through the deputy mayor. So the way our funding actually works is we actually receive no um, operating dollars from the city budget. We actually are quite proud that we're a self-sufficient um, agency. And what those management fees actually represent, and to be completely honest, it hasn't always been that case. But what those, um, that city funding note represents, and it's actually something that, um, I don't think it accurately reflects what it is. It's actually a service fee that we're charging for work that we're doing on behalf of various different capital projects on behalf of the city. Oh, okay. And so we're actually working with our auditors. This is one thing that we keep going back and forth on. We want it to say service fee, so it actually reflects the work that we're doing. So through the city's budget process, various agencies will go through, they'll get their project capital projects approved, and being the real estate advisors to the city, we work on those projects, and these are the fees that are charged to ensure that those projects advance. So, for example, the, the amount that you're seeing there, about $2.7 million has been um, allocated to move the Housing Now sites forward and advance right. that initiative. Another $1.4 has um, been allocated to move the Modern TO initiative forward. And so any projects that we're working on, those are dollars coming from capital projects that have been approved in the Housing Secretariat or in CREM. The management fee is what is left over. So historically, when we weren't working on capital projects, that management fee um, was larger because it was, and where that management fee is coming from, I'm not sure if everyone on council is aware, 
But CreateTO manages the legacy corporations being right. TPLC yeah. and Build Toronto. So T, uh, CreateTO, we charge a management fee to actually ensure that all the operations of TPLC and Build Toronto continue to, to evolve. And that's where that management fee comes in. So right. it has been, okay, whatever is left. But we're working, um, you know, we, we take this stuff quite seriously and we're working very diligently to ensure that we continue to increase those revenues in the Portland. So regardless of the, the capital budgets that are ongoing, we can be a truly self-sufficient agency and, and not, yeah. Uh, yeah. not drain uh, city budgets at all. So it kind of is a semantic thing because I looked at it and I thought, okay, the budget was for, you know, give or take six million, uh, but we seem to have topped you up, but but we didn't top you up. Those were actual fees Additional as well. projects. I yes. always, every, every time we get the, the CREATO uh, statements, I stumble over this. I, I, I don't know what the accounting rationale is behind not calling them service fees. We are very I, close. I stumble over it every time, and then I think, Wait a minute. Are they self-sufficient or not? Are we topping up? But, we're, but so we're clearly not here, is what you're saying. That's correct. Because by certainly by now we're supposed to be self-sufficient, and you are. There's just a there's a semantic issue here more than anything. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that explanation. Now, how do we fix this so that it doesn't happen to me again in two years' time? We are very close. I think we have the auditors on side, and we think when this comes to you next year, it will say service fees, and this can this can go away. Yeah, because it looked like KPMG kind of stumbled over the wording in making a note about this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there you go. Not trying to give you a hard time, Mr. Gupta. That that helps me a lot. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. And and count and through you, uh, Deputy Mayor Councilor Kerr, we're happy to you know honestly like walk through in greater detail if you'd ever like to kind of uh, what those various fees are, project fees are, and and how much revenue we're generating overall, and just not that you need to bo boil over more numbers, but happy to happy to spend <laughs> any any amount of time with you like. Well, that is my jam. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> as you remember. Um, yeah. The other question I wanted to ask is that I, I read through the highlight report and I love it, but I'm wondering if you can give us, um, what will we see in the next highlight report? Will we see more completed projects or, 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 or a number of them s still struggling? Because there's such vision in the highlight report. And we, 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 you know, we had this discussion during the housing now. We would love to see some real completions. Yeah, I mean, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, I'll, I'll take that, uh, Councillor Carroll. We absolutely, I think that the short answer would be a big resounding yes. I think part of the objective of the highlights report is to bring to life uh, for uh, Council and for the public um, the project, you know, the, the, the true life projects that we're actually working on. You know, they are kind of... Uh, um, um, uh, you know, other uses maybe at the moment or, 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 or just uh, um, uh, piles of dirt or what have you, but they, you know, we anticipate uh, a lot more pro progress and certainly thanks to the commitment that council made at the last meeting uh, on uh, the housing now program, we expect to see shovels in the ground on three sites. Uh, two of them probably before the end of the summer and the third before the end of the year. So I think uh, next year, uh, you know, I should say this, fingers crossed, but we definitely will have progress and we'll certainly have a lot more projects uh, in the ground and closer to completion. Okay, fantastic. Those are my questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Additional questions on this item? Councillor Pasternak, bye. Great, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, through through you to uh, create staff, I guess one of the things when it comes to developing real estate is it never seems to move fast enough. Um, specifically in a, in a parcel of land in my area, Allen District, um, which is about 55 acres of city land, vacant. Um, it's the district plan has been adopted by council and um, there's, many elements of society, including those looking for affordable, are looking to move on with this. Uh, city planning, on the other hand, wants to reopen it and try and get uh, more density in the apartment neighborhoods. Don't we reach a point when it comes to real estate that you just have to get on with it and stop going back and trying to negotiate and uh, start the process all over again for, for more density? What What is the plan uh, with, with the Allen District and, and 
do you, would you agree that it's it you've reached a time after 10 years of working on on a on a real estate parcel that it's really time to get on with it and through you uh, uh uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, I'll, I'll address that, and then certainly Jasper, if you have anything more specific, we, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say Councillor Pasternak, um, much of that time precedes uh, my time at Create, and and I wasn't at Bill Toronto, but um, yeah, I, I'd say absolutely, we we do want to get on with it. We're very anxious to uh, uh, get out to market on on um, uh, on on development blocks within that overall Alanese district. Um, I, you know, I think at the same time, you know, the, the guidance that we have also had from planning is that they're, uh, you know, again, in, in the spirit of trying to generate as much housing and affordable housing as we can, I think, um, in light of some of the changes with the airport no longer continuing, I think there's was an opportunity to look at a little bit of extra density in the apartments district. I, I don't know if that delays our ability to move ahead with the other district or the other, um, uh, land use uh, uh, zoning permissions in the neighborhoods district, and I think our intent, uh, Councillor, is to move ahead with that um, uh, quite, quite, you know, quite soon. Um, I don't have the exact timing, and I can give you that. But we're we're anxious as well to get on with it, and I appreciate your uh, your reminder of the sense of urgency to just get on with it. But we're we're keen on on furthering that. But we do want to take advantage of opportunity for a little more density now that the restrictions with the airport are 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 coming off. Okay. Uh, well, that's we'll continue that discussion uh, offline. When it comes to the housing at now sites, now the the, uh, the speed at which they're going uh, is is putting a drag on your on your balance sheet. From from what I can see here, would you say that um, insufficient infrastructure is is the main thing that's holding you back from developing those sites? I, I, well, I, I threw you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, I would say uh, it's a combination of, of a number of factors. But, you know, I think, you know, I think we've identified in the past that we certainly could have uh, overall as a city uh, had a little more um, understanding of some of the site constraints uh, and, and worked on those before maybe announcements were made on those sites. But I think having said that, I think really the limitation Wilson Heights is a every every site has its own uh, uh, factors a uh, counselor and I think Wilson Heights we knew that the sewer would take um, would take then the Westgate sewer would would was was budgeted was in design it takes time to build such a massive project and 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 we need to ensure that that it's ready for when that development is built but I would say that overall the housing now program has suffered uh, because of two main factors that are directly a result of the pandemic. One is massive construction cost escalation, 60% over four years, and um, uh, just very, very significant inflation, which has led to interest rates now that are, are above 7%. And when the program was initiated, interest rates were below 2%. So I think that combination and, and our desire to keep the affordable levels at one third and 80% of average market rent over 99 years, that's sort of that pillar. Um, so as a result of that, you know, you've got to find a little bit more equity to make those deals work. And so again, thanks to council's decision, we think we, we now have a platform to move ahead uh, with these sites. Okay, uh, thanks Vic, thanks very much. Matt. Thank you, additional questions? You got it. Okay, seeing none, speakers on this item. Seeing none, Council Carroll would like to move staff recommendations. All those in favor, all those opposed, that item carries. EX 5.8, diversifying civic appointees on Toronto Transit Commission. Councillor Chang, you had questions? Oh, it's just about the motion. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, it looked like there was some uh, time urgency because Councillor Myers was hoping to impact the formation of the TTC board, but I don't know if um, this would then mean we would have to wait a whole other cycle of the board. So board. we can let staff answer that question of the process okay. that they have going on. Okay, they great. did prepare a supporting report which also described the current process. So did you wanna answer the question? Sure, yeah. yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, through the deputy mayor, 
So um, as you may know, Councillor, in the supplemental report, what it speaks to is the fact that the Civic Appointments Committee recently completed interviews for the TTC for two of the four public member positions on the board. Uh, those recommended candidates are going to the next meeting of City Council. So we wanted to share that context with members to help them appreciate um, that any changes that could be adopted by Council, it would take some time for those to uh, come to fruition since there are two public members on the board whose terms are not up for another two years. And there's a process which is uh, now at its sort of end stage, so to speak, near the end stage of members being appointed by council or considered by council. Okay, great. So I, I see that the motion is urgent and I'm just wondering what would be the timeline of the report um, in order to know what that impact will be on future board appointments? So uh, through the Deputy Mayor, one of the things that our team has been looking at is, as you know, Council has adopted a public appointments policy, which sets a very high-level framework for all the work that our team does and the, the role of staff and the role of councillors in looking at public appointments to all our boards, committees, and tribunals. Um, we have been working on revising that policy. We're hoping to bring forward some revisions uh, in the fall. The date is TBD, but that's our rough target right now. And I can tell you our, our general goal is not to um, bring forward any uh, uh, dramatic changes that would change the roles of staff and council, but we do want to clarify some of the business processes in there and look at some of the language and make sure it's up to date and reflects our current best practice. So uh, if there is a desire from members of council to um, look at how we build representation into our processes, then we can make that uh, part of the work that we're doing when we bring forward a new revised policy as well. Um, and I would just make a request without making a motion. Could we include Councillor Myers and Councillor Morley in the formation of this work so that, because um, there was a very strong intention with the initial motion uh, to, in order to impact the outcome. And so changing it to a study means they won't impact the immediate outcome. Uh, and I just want their concerns to be reflected uh, in the study that is going to happen. Absolutely, yes. Through the Deputy Mayor, we're happy to work uh, with Councillor Myers and Morley and any members of Council, of course, who are, who are interested in this work. Um, we haven't um, had any sort of briefings or anything on it yet because it's still a bit in the rough stage with many track changes in the document. But um, as we get closer to bringing something forward, we welcome any input from uh, members, particularly those who uh, are involved in these sorts of processes. Mm -hmm. I would always ask people for the ingredients they want to add to the dish before the dish is fully cooked. I don't know if that's an analogy, but just get the input before it's fully baked is I guess what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll? Yeah, just some questions because I, you know, I know we're forwarding this motion, but I'm wondering if staff want to comment. Uh, I know you'll, you'll touch on this in the report. But um, there's a piece in, in Councillor Meyer's motion, and, 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 and he met with me beforehand. I, 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 uh, I applaud moving the motion and getting the discussion going, but I'm wondering if staff wanted to comment because we've gone around the, the block with the, the concept of having a person from each of the four areas before. Um, and we struggled with it because it's, it, it, it can lock you into a place where you can't meet the various you know, the human rights uh, uh, charter groupings that we have in our policy. You could you could be stuck, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, we don't have someone from North York, so while we could meet our, our diversity target and, and have the right perspective we want for this board, I need one from North York, so forget you. Um, and we, so we, we struggled with that when we tried to approach that, and, and so it's not in the policy currently. Um, are we getting a, a level of diversity in applicants now that it's less of a risk to, to add that geographical application? Um, thank you for the question through the Deputy Mayor. I can say in general, um, I'm happy to say that we get um, excellent applications, particularly for the TTC and some of the higher profile boards. We get applications from across the city, many excellent, highly skilled, diverse candidates. Um, for some of our smaller uh, boards that are lower profile, the numbers may be lower, but the quality is always there. 
Um, so um, in, in general, uh, I would say, yes, for boards like the TTC, there is obviously a keen interest amongst people in Toronto in this service. So we do get a lot of people applying. Um, so uh, the, there are, often there are options available. There's, and there are many factors to look at when members are considering who to bring forward. Okay, and and I I don't know what you're anticipating. Uh, if there are any sort of you know new things you want us to think about when it comes to us later this year, but I I also wonder because when this policy was made, I don't, I don't think we when we first started developing the policy we use today, I don't think we even had the hybrid TTC board yet. But um, you know, in its evolution, we're now at a point where the TTC isn't really about designing new systems anymore. It, it, it's about running a base system. And so where we used to say, it doesn't matter whether you use the transit system or not, it kind of does. Because <laughs> uh, that's all we do. We, we deal mainly with the, the, the customer experience right now. And so it kind of does. But when we're developing a policy for appointment, um, are we just gonna get uh, a sort of general list or will we get um, will we get also a, a, a how to develop guidelines around each board? Like, who do you want on your TTC? Who do you want on your hydro board from a skills-based and perspective base? Um, is that is that going to be introduced into the policy, or is, or is that is that a dangerous road to go down? Um, through the deputy mayor, there's sort of two things at play there. So the public appointments policy in its current form, and I, I don't think this would change going forward, it's intended to be a high-level framework right. that outlines um, the process and the principles and how the work is done. Um, things uh, related to uh, composition and governance of boards, how many people might be on a board, right. if there is uh, hard-coded representation for community council area, members of different communities and so on, that's more of a conversation that I think we would have with colleagues from the city manager's office who look at the governance of all our boards and those relationship frameworks. So uh, the public appointments policy does not at this stage contain um, that type of language. And I think we would sort of, my view is we would maintain the focus on it being a framework for the appointments process and, and which follows from if, if uh, council says, well, the Board of Health will have X number of members that should meet X, Y, Z criteria, then the public appointments policy then says to everyone, here's how we then do that work. But it doesn't okay. say the, pub, the Board of Health shall right. look like this. Okay, so we could, we could achieve what, what Councillor Myers is going after. I think a number of councillors agree with them, but there are a variety of ways to do it, and, and, and not just this policy, but a variety of ways, but we could get there. Yes, I would say, again, through the deputy mayor, if uh, council has an interest in, uh, uh, as I'll say, hard coding representation in different boards and committees, then that, I would say um, that that's a conversation we could also have with uh, governance colleagues in the city manager's office. It wouldn't be strictly through our policy. Right, right. And uh, I, I won't ask questions about that today, Madam Chair, because we, we don't have the, the, the relationship framework team here, but uh, I think I'll, I'll take it offline because I, I, I think we could, we could actually, oh, we do, it's Jones. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> can I ask one more question? I didn't notice it was no, me too. Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> one more question since, since Karen is here. Um, so do we have, did, uh, there was a long-standing struggle to get a, uh, a proper relationship uh, framework with the TTC. I don't know if we have it at the, at the moment. Do we have our, our completed relationship framework there? So uh, through the Deputy Mayor, uh, Council Carroll, um, good question. I have to assure you uh, that all the cities, agencies, and corporations have established council approved governance structures, including the TTC. I want to assure you of that. The TTC has a dedicated chapter in the Toronto Municipal Code that uh, deals with all the required elements that normally would reside in a relationship framework. Okay. The relationship framework goes a little bit farther to incorporate the legislative framework for, uh, for the boards. And so it's a very high 
compendium, but it doesn't set the relationship with City of Toronto. Right, right. Okay, so we can follow on that after. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, those are my questions. Thank Thanks, you, Madam Crawford. Chair, for that indulgence. Okay, thank you. Councillor Crawford had questions? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just, I guess, following up on a bit of what Councillor was talking about and, and getting more on process, Matthew. Um, so I look at these three ABC represent four community for community council areas, uh, identifying a person with a disability and regular transit users. Now, so part of the process, recon recognizing that sort of relationship framework and there's, say, no hard cap or specifics, as we go through the process, that sometimes, and I think there's maybe a mis misrepresentation that these areas are not necessary, unless we can put them into policy and that we have to do this, that that's not talked about. So when we're looking at the process, uh, and I'm just looking at those three, and there are others, um, are part of a conversation, are part of the framework as part of the civic appointments process um, on the staff side, not only that, but I think on the political side, again, me as being chair, that, and then we have those conversations. So I just want to ensure that, you know, if we're moving this forward to, um, to, for, for you to look at broadly, it doesn't suggest that we do not look at these you know, as we're part of the process. And again, part of that process we had just gone through in identifying the two TTC people, um, this was part of that process and conversation. Yes, through the Deputy Mayor, I can clarify that um, uh, Council has the ability now to, to put forward people that would meet these criteria if it wishes, and when Civic Appointments Committee and other nominating panels are looking at filling vacancies on boards, there are many, many factors which they consider. And again, the public appointments policy speaks to this broadly and says, when you are doing appointments, here are a number of things you can consider, including geographic representation, the skills and qualifications, particular eligibility of a board, um, representation from equity-deserving communities, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of TTC, there are four public member positions and members of council and uh, in your case, uh, Councillor Crawford, members of the Civic Appointments Committee in particular, um, can consider many, many lenses to uh, when nominating candidates to fill just those four seats. So there's certainly, a, I would say, some intersectionality is, is one of the approaches that members might take when, when doing this work to try and achieve all the different aims that they may have. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions? Okay, uh, Councillor Pastrana. Yeah, just just very quickly, um, the the TTC uh, commission actually comes from two different sources. One actually comes from striking committee, where various councillors are appointed on it. And they represent various geographical areas uh, in the city, and the other component comes from civic appointments. So, what's before us is the seems to be the civic appointments piece that they should come from the four community council areas. But striking may also have that same vision. So you could have an elected representative technically representing on, on, on the TTC, representing a geographical area and covering that, that would diminish the requirement of civic appointments to, to fill a slot in, in, in that geographical lens. Would you? Do you see a problem there or, or a solution? Uh, through the deputy mayor, uh, I, uh, I see your, I appreciate your, your question, councillor. Um, I don't work directly in the striking committee process, so I can't comment too much on that, but certainly there are uh, uh, six members of council on the TTC board, and obviously they, I, I think, would bring many perspectives to the table, including that of their local constituents. Um, just as our public members appointed to the TTC, may be considering uh, the neighborhoods which they come from, but also um, I think ideally looking at issues citywide as well and thinking about the, the, the broad impacts of transit across the city. So I think there are probably many hats that all members wear around the table. So just very quickly, I, I was on civic appointments for, for a few years and um, many of the human rights requirements, they were, they were basically guidelines on, on appointments. Those are in place now. Uh, whether whether it, it come to the the wide range of, of diversity that we want on our ABCs, uh, how do I don't see this changing that in any way? Um, we're we're already kind of we're already in that process, and we already have a city policy. Uh, through the deputy mayor, um, 
uh, you know, Councillor Myers could best speak to the motion, but I think the distinction here is that uh, um, council can achieve these particular things in the motion now um, if it wishes, and it's part of what council already considers when doing appointments. And my understanding is the intent of the motion is to make it mandatory for TTC appointments uh, at some point going forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Additional questions? Last call. Speakers this item. I know Councillor Carroll, you want to speak. Additional speakers? Councillor Morley. Oh, sorry, my, my mic was not. Okay, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Morley, Councillor Crawford. Yeah, I I do I, I actually I had this conversation with uh, with uh, our colleague uh, Councillor Myers, but I wanted to share share it with the council as well. Um and we're, we're forwarding this motion, we're giving it to staff for consideration, but I, I understand completely why he wants to move this motion. The fact that the, the check and balance to our public appointments policy is supposed to be us, council of the whole of the council session, but it isn't really. That is not the check and balance at the end of the stream. Um, if you try to hold an appointment that has come to council for ratification and God forbid propose another who wasn't selected, everyone loses their mind. Whether it's in public or in camera, we've tried both over the years, everyone loses their mind. So that check and balance isn't really there. So I really understand why Councillor Myers wants to go upstream and, and change the policy. Because you, you, you really don't get uh, any uh, uh, breathing space at all if you try to address it. Um, outside of the being part of the civic appointments process as a counselor where you are supposed to have a right to do it. Um, but I, 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 I am just cautioning about the geographical component that's in here. I'm very nervous about that one because um, it really does close you off from all of our diversity lenses uh, in some situations depending on the applicants. Um, and I'll, I'll give a perfect example, and one that really should be considered with respect to transit. Um, who absolutely needs transit? Uh, young people. Young people. Uh, but most of the people that are today between 25 and 34 are, are thinking their lives through of never owning a car because of our housing crisis. And so they need transit. God, they need transit. Um, and I'll tell you something. Of all, everyone who applies for all of our public appointments, it's right there on the website, 18.7% are young people between the age of 25 and 34. And council years ago said there should always be a young person on the transit commission. And the only way that happens is if by accident someone really young gets elected to council. They never make it there by way of public appointment and not for lack of trying. 18.7% of all public applicants are 18 point, uh, are, uh, are 25 to 34. Uh, only 12% of them ever get an interview. And in appointees, we skew to the 40s and 50s. 13% uh, of young people get appointed. And what do they get appointed to? Uh, probably the, the highest echelon would be the library board. Occasionally we have a young person there. Uh, and that's one of our lenses. That is a form of diversity in terms of forming an opinion in public policy and making decisions, making sure that you have that lens on things, that youth lens. That's a big part of our ridership. Um, heaven forbid you should be young and a woman. There's, there's no way you're getting an interview for the DTC commission. That's, that's been my experience thus far. So I have deep sympathy for Councillor Myers um, moving this uh, uh, motion, but I just caution that what if that young woman, uh, could even be a BIPOC woman, uh, shows up and applies to be on the TTC, but you've already picked someone from North York and that's where she lives. Um, and and then, then you've really tied your hands just geographically. To me, it's much more important that we meet those diversity lenses that, that we've put in our policy and, and we'll probably enhance the language for them in this, this uh, new iteration that's coming. But those, those are what is, is prime to me. Um, you know, and, and we've had great experience with when we make a public appointment, 
um, once appointed, people people start traveling all over the uh, the city trying to know the system. We've been very lucky in terms of people who've joined the TTC, but I. I just uh, go back to the time when in council, at the end of the process, I tried to say, how could you miss a young, black, uh, uh, openly identified in his application as gay man who is a capital projects analyst at KPMG and applied to be on the TTC, and yet he somehow didn't make it. Uh, I don't know what the constraints were around it, um, but, I didn't get to bring him into the to the consideration at the end of the process. So what's coming to us in the fall, what we would do at the top end of the process by embedding it in policy, any conversation we can have with the city manager's office around relationship framework to achieve some of the things that council feels are not happening, that's the only real avenue we have to get that done. So uh, um, I hope that this gets incorporated into the work in that way at, uh, by the end of this year. Thank you. And apologies, I forgot to restart the timer from the question. So, um, bonus Councilor, time. Yeah, Thank maybe, you. maybe more, maybe <laughs> less. I don't know because I didn't reset it. Uh, Councillor Morley and then Councillor Crawford. I'm going to reset it though. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. Um, and I obviously did second this most motion um, from Council Myers. Uh, and just wanting to really highlight some of the points of conversation that we've had to date. We did uh, just go through the TPC interview um, and recommendation process. So that will be on the agenda for Council. Um, and so to some of the points of conversation, you know, this isn't a right now opportunity, but I appreciate uh, Deputy Mayor, your uh, additional motion to have staff look at this as part of the report coming in the fall. Um, and I think really uh, to, to the point that Councilor Carroll made, uh, this is an attempt to further um, bake in or hardwire um, some of these priorities into our policies um, so that we can make sure that we are, um, you know, implementing best practices uh, and ensuring that the checks and balances of the folks with line of sight uh, in these very critical uh, agencies and other, you know, um, boards are um, representative of the, the City of Toronto are in alignment with the priorities of council um, and, uh, and that we're able to really do do our best to get a, a great diverse um, a group of folks. And so I thank colleagues for their for their uh, questions and conversation around this. I think we're all very clear uh, that these are important priorities for our city. Um, and I hope folks will support um, sending this back to staff to come uh, forward with us for additional recommendations. I will just also note, uh, Councillor Carroll, that I did flag the concern around the geographic consideration for exactly the same reasons that you presented. Um, and so my hope is that staff are able to, again, come back to us with some uh, additional guidance and recommendations on how best to navigate those people. Those are my comments. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crawford? Yeah, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, so I also do recognize uh, Councillor uh, Morley and um, uh, Myers' uh, motion here, uh, understanding they're they're on the, on the committee with me. Um, but but I also and when I read the motion and I'll read it out quickly, it says as part of the current selection process for TTC board members to recommend candidates for the Toronto Transit Commission board with the following criteria, um, and it suggests that there's a bit of a, we need to get this to council to sort of embed something here. I just want to remind everybody I have been on. Uh, the committee got seven, eight years. All these uh, categories, everything we look at, we look at all of that as part of our conversations, as part of the process. So it is frankly, in, from my perspective, embedded in there. It may not be specific on the policy side, but those are the conversations that I personally, over seven, eight years, have had with staff when you're looking at geographic representation, when you're looking at, and with the TTC, with identifying people with disabilities. It's, and again, whether we have this or not as policy, those conversations take place and um, they take place in the committee. So again, recognizing that uh, it's important to have those conversations, I think moving it forward to staff to look at it broadly. Um, and as Councillor Carroll and a few have, others have mentioned, when you embed in having four community council areas represented, there are challenges with that. And that's the conversation we have. I've, I think I've had it with Matthew uh, about, and I look at that when I look at the dozens, if not hundreds of applications that come through, I look at all these criteria. We all actually look at all these criteria and that's the conversation we have. So I just I want to remind colleagues that this is actually part of the process and the fact that we're just moving this forward doesn't suggest that we don't have that as part of the process. Thanks. Okay, any additional speakers? 
Okay, so with that, we have one motion. All those in favor? All those opposed? Item carries. Item is amended. All those in favor? All those opposed? The items carry. Um, I am going to confirm that's all for business. Is that it? We're good? Okay, we're done. Okay, so here's the plan. If you want to see the balloons, we will meet in 10 minutes. So at 1118, specifically. Yes, field trip. Um, but that gives you time to go to the restroom, eat some cake coffee, etc., and we will meet at the wagon, which you can't miss out there, at 11, 18, and then we will walk over together. And then just counselors, if you are not going, flag that to me because then I don't need to do the attendance and include you in it. So feel, true field trip here. So we can't all post the same picture of the balloons. We have to mix it up a bit before we Instagram. Okay, that, that's, 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 that's the that instruction. Learned. Yeah. Okay, thank you for joining us, Councillor Morley. Okay, 11, 18 at the wagon. Thank <laughs> you.